Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome Maris Canilleri to talk to us. Maris um, is currently doing a postdoc at the University of Vienna on uh, possession. And um, Maris started off with her BA at the University of Malta. Her speciality is Maltese linguistics and uh, then went to Essex for an MRes, and then uh, University of Surrey for her PhD, which was on... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember the... Uh, stem the stem, the, the verb stems in Maltese yeah. from an LFG perspective. Uh, so Maris is, um, does a lot of work on morphosyntax, predominantly from an LFG perspective. I don't think we're going to get LFG today, but what we're going to hear about is uh, possession and other things expressed by la and and in Maltese. So Good. Please. Right, so <clears throat> essentially la and and, keep them in mind, and we're going to see literally a journey of change. So the aim of this talk is to take you through this diachronic path of change using Original, um, the original prepositions la and and in Maltese. And I want to show you that uh, these original prepositions have actually developed in verbs as well as auxiliaries in the language. <coughs> and la has also taken off its, um, taken on a separate route as a case marker. And I guess one of my contributions here, apart from, from illustrating the diachronic change itself, is to say that um, la and and are actually in a complementary distribution. And they do not just realize um, possessive relations in Maltese, but also um, they have developed into other auxiliary types, including um, modal auxiliaries. Right, so for those of you who have no idea um, what Maltese is, actually, in terms of sociolinguistics, it's a language on its own. However, <coughs> if you exclude sociolinguistic considerations and just look at the grammar, really Maltese is just as any other Arabic dialect. And because of that, um, I'll start with what I believe to have been the precursor of and and la, and that's the state of affairs in classical Arabic. So essentially, classical Arabic um, has both these same prepositions, inda and li, or la, depending where it is. So, ind introduces a locative argument as opposed to li, which introduces more specifically a directional argument, so a goal argument, for example. So these are two um, Quranic Arabic examples illustrating the use of both inda and li in terms of pre as prepositions, but introducing locative and goal arguments respectively. Then specifically in two, we've got two nice uses of the same preposition, uh, which this time are specifically introducing a goal or recipient argument, which is human. Right. However, the same two prepositions within the same text, that is, and within the same period, um, can also be used as possessive markers, okay? Or at least through them, you can construct a possessive structure. So as you can see from 3a and 3b, essentially the theme, so possessive structures will include a possessor as well as a theme argument. And in this context, we observe that we've got an alternate use, which is presumably in free variation, given that the theme in both contexts is the same splendid reward. Okay, so, so that's... Uh, an, an interesting observation that you see these two prepositions being used both in the locative usual use as well as to introduce, I mean, to build possessive structures and they are being used with the same thing, okay? So possibly that's a free variation use of either of the two prepositions. Sorry. Right, so if you were to um, put these two constructions in the past tense, you just have to add the auxiliary kana, which um, agrees with the theme. Okay, So it happens that the theme in this context is feminine. So in this case, you can really clearly see that uh, the agreement of the auxiliary, the tense marker, is actually with the theme, which makes it subject-like. Right. So if we consider um, Highness accounts of possession, especially 1997, uh, we can assume that this use of inda and li are instances of what he would refer to as a locative 
and goal schemas which allow us to get to a positive interpretation with them. So this is the schema. So the locative one is y is at x's place, okay? Such that that locative construction, as it were, yields a possessive interpretation such that x has or owns y. Uh, similarly, the goal schema is just a change in the schema, having a 2x as opposed to x's place, which yields a possessive reading. Right. However, um, Heine's account is not simply diachronic. Rather, he, through such, um, through such an organization of the, the locatives into becoming locative schema, becoming a possessive construction, he also makes uh, a clear, I believe, a clear statement with respect to the syntax of such constructions. So he believes that um, possessive structures, which are derived out of locative and goal schemas, apart from other sort of schemas, are intransitive in nature, okay? such that the possessi is encoded as the subject with the possessor then being treated as a locative or goal complement. Right. So in Heine's typology of possessive structures, the only transitive possessive structure is the one of the English type, which is derived out of what he refers to as an action schema, where diachronically it was itself already a transitive structure, such that x takes y, for example, that yields x has owns y. Okay? So this is something to keep in mind, that there is this interesting, I mean, according to Heine, possessives derived out of locative or goal schemas are intransitive, while the English type are transitive, which are not of the locative and goal schemas. Okay, so for Arabic, additional proof that we are actually dealing with uh, a theme that is in a subject position is not merely the agreement on the on the auxiliary, but also the nominative marking on the theme, okay? As opposed to the genitive marking of the possessor, which is embedded under the preposition. So six would be a topicalized possessive structure of classical Arabic. So you see that Zayed takes a topic position, uh, whereas Khanat is your auxiliary, which is yielding this uh, tense feature. Inda is our predicate, which is a preposition. And then you've got the resumptive pronoun binding with the topic. And then you've got the subject, which is uh, the theme. Okay? And then you find agreement between the theme and the auxiliary. And that is an intransitive structure, indeed. So then when we consider locatives and possessives in Maltese, we find that, yes, we're also using the same sort of preposition, right? And. So seven is a locative construction, uktib and paulu, as opposed to eight, which is a possessive structure, paulu and uktib. Right. So what I really want to say is that um, this preposition, this and preposition, has actually developed as a verb in possessive constructions in Maltese. Okay. So while diachronically the possessive construction involved prepositions, I believe, okay, diachronically, just as it was the case in classical Arabic, say. Synchronically, however, I will argue for a possessive construction that involves transitive verbal predicates as opposed to a possessive structure. So that would be one of the contributions in the ongoing um, discussion on possessive structures in Maltese. Additionally, I want to say that uh, the two different prepositions which are used in classical Arabic in free variation are actually allomorphically related in Maltese. So that would be another point that would be mentioned. Right, so this is what I believe to have been the, the path, as it were, the path of gradual change, okay? So let me explain it in a bit of detail. Right, so this is the, this part is what you have in classical Arabic, okay? So you've got a preposition, which is either followed by a pronoun, or as the possessor is expressed as a noun phrase, no problem. And then you've got the theme as an MP, right? So that was kind of the precursor of the possessor construction, which actually has the same structure as a locative, stru as a locative construction, okay? Then that preceded a change which involved topicalization, such that um, the possessor now takes on a topic function, and that topic requires binding via resumptive pronoun, and that is the resumptive pronoun you get attached on the preposition. And the theme remains in situ in its usual position. 
However, this is what I'll be arguing for, for Maltese, is that this middle phase has yielded this current synchronic phase, whereby what we've got is a topic that has been reinterpreted as the subject, so the possessor now is the subject, and then you, you've got um, the predicate, which was once a preposition, has now become a verb, and what was previously a resumptive pronoun is now actually agreement, and then you've got the noun phrase, the theme noun phrase, okay? And the possessor becomes optional, such that you can drop it, because Maltese, like Arabic, is a pro-drop language, and then what you end up with is either agreement or a pronominal form that takes on a subject status, depending on whether you've got the NP possessor of it or not. Okay? So that is the, what I believe to have been the trajectory of change. And the last one is the final synchronic state. So, this, so 9 would be representative of the exact equivalent to the classical Arabic structure, where, where the possessor is interpreted as a topic, which is bound to the argument of and, the preposition, that is, and the theme is the subject. So that is exactly the same structure which we had for Arabic, okay, which is for classical Arabic, which is the synchronic state of affairs for classical Arabic. What I want to say is that this is not the synchronic state of affairs in Maltese, but rather this is, such that the possessive construction is transitive in nature, where Paulu is actually our subject, agreement, and that's a verb now, and ktip takes on an object function. Okay, so this is what um, this is the end state. Okay, but now I'm going to give you the evidence why I believe or I'm assuming that this is truly the end state. Okay, so I'm going to give evidence both for the verbal nature of and in this context, as opposed to the prepositional nature, which was its kind of precursor, as well as uh, more evidence that the possessor is really a subject of Maltese. And the theme is really an object in Maltese, as opposed to the other order, other mapping which we've got in, uh, in classical Arabic. Okay, so this would be the set of evidence I'll be considering, essentially word order, negation, realization differences, the behavior of QP subjects, agreement, and accusative marking of the team. Okay? Right, so in, in general, if you've got a uh, locative, so I'll be, blue will be my locatives, okay, and green will be my possessives, and hence one will be a P and one will be a verb, okay? So in 11, you've got an order such that uh, the team is preceding a prepositional phrase, okay? Il fiori fu il and Paolo. So and is functioning, and in blue, which is locative, therefore, is functioning in the same way just as any other preposition, and the theme is preceding, okay? Yet, when you consider the, con the possessive construction, which I believe to be a, ver to be a verb, we observe that um, themes follow, typically follow verbs. When it comes to verbs, themes typically follow verbs. So you've got tip, which is a theme, which is following a usual verb form. And in this context, in the possession, we observe that the theme is actually following the possessor. Another word order effect is that if we were to shuffle around the constituents in a locative structure, we will need the insertion of the existential proform, which is M in Maltese, okay? So 13A represents a uh, shuffled around, like, um, it's not the canonical order, so you, we can displace things around. <coughs> so the displacement of MEDA from its usual canonical position requires the presence of M, the existential M. Removing it will yield to ungrammaticality. On the other hand, if we still believe that Maida is the theme which should be equivalent to Maida, the theme in the locative structure, then nothing would account for the fact that we do not have, we do not need to have the M insertion in this context, in the possessive. Of course, M is possible in in the realm of and, right? However, the only reading you can ever get with M is a locative one. So 15A is simply a normal locative structure, non-shuffle, that is, in its canonical word order. So However, shuffling around the constituents, uh, or um, presenting more emphasis, say, would only yield the locative use, the locative interpretation of and, okay? So that, that's one difference. 
Then negation realization, I think this is a more robust, one of, I think one of the most robust um, tests. So a finite negation in Maltese involves this use of two parts, as it were, a ma and the sh attached, as opposed to um, negation of a preposition, for example, a prepositional predicate, in which case you'd need to get um, like a pronominal form which includes the ma sh. So we'll just refer to that as pronomen negation. But I, I hope you can see that there is a difference between the predicate is there and then you've got ma sh attached to it, the predicate is fu, and then you get uh, pronomen negation, which is negating the whole constituent. Right. So then if we insert and, <laughs> we observe that and as a verb, so that is and in its possessive use, actually yields the m sh attachment just as verbs, whereas um, the negation of the locative use of and requires us to use a pronominal form. Okay? So mu sh or mi shandom. Right, so another test. So for Maltese it has been observed that um, while quantifier phrases can actually be subjects, so like in 18, this is an NP, Paolo, and Kultifel is every boy is a QP, quantifier phrase, that can be a subject, fine. Yet um, QPs as topics that are bound to a resumptive pronoun, so they form, they are part of a clitic left dislocation structure, are not possible as topics. So while il paulo as an NP is okay to be bound by the pronoun on ra, on the verb, a QP is not possible. Okay? So you, I can't have il kultifel right to mar, ra to maria. However, in the case of our possessive structure, it's possible to get kultifel and lebdatifel, which are both QPs. So if we were to say that the u on and is still the resumptive pronoun attached onto a preposition, then these can't be topics themselves. That means, therefore, that these must be subjects and the u on and must be analyzed as a, an agreement marker, as opposed to a resumptive pronoun attached onto a p. So I think these are all, you know, pushing towards the, the verbal use of and. Right, another fact um, that's agreement with the auxiliary, kin. So what we observe is that um, the use of and in its possessive use allow us to get um, either default agreement on, on the past tense auxiliary or as agreement with the possessor, okay, as opposed to what we get in classical Arabic, which is agreement with the theme. Right, so that's cont, one is g, which is um, co-indexed with the E and D, which is also one as G. So this is different, however, from the obligatory um, agreement which you get on the same auxiliary in a possessive, in a locative structure. Okay, so agreement in this context must be with the real subject, which is the theme in the locative construction. Okay, il kodba, and then you have to have kienu because kodba is plural, and hence you get triple agreement. So. All this is another difference between the two. A further difference is uh, the agreement fact on raising, which I, on raising predicates, which I believe is another robust proof that we're dealing with um, a possessor that has become a subject of Maltese. So if we take uh, the aspectualizer reja to repeat, to do again, um, we, f we observe that it's, a, it's an obligatory subject-subject raising predicate. So rau, so this is, it so happens that Maltese does not have non-finite forms really, so don't bother about the fact that we don't have the two equivalent in English, okay? It's finite raising is possible in Maltese. So in the embedded clause, you've got a third person inflected, third person plural inflected verb form, and then you get the same agreement via raising on the, on the S spectralizer. So getting a default reading is, yields to ungrammaticality, okay? So that implies that this is a subject subject raising predicate. Right. So then, if you insert and, the possessive and, in the embedded clause, you find that you actually need to have agreement chained, as it were, right? So the third person feminine agreement on and, which is representative of the possessor, actually becomes the agreement on reja, which is, which itself requires subject subject raising, okay? So you get 3SGF agreement there. Same follows for spitcha, which is another 
um, a specializer. And then uh, the same facts follow for the scene predicate, okay, which is the canonical raising predicate as it were. Right, um, it's true, however, that in the matrix, we could have had a third person singular masculine form in this context. But I argue that that would be the equivalent of the it expletive in, uh, the equivalent of it expletive in English. Like, it seems that as opposed to uh, she seems to have gone. Okay? Right. So now, so the evidence which we had so far was both for the subject status of the possessor as well as the verb like status of the predicate as opposed to its original prepositional status. Now, what I'm going to argue for is the is the grammatical function of the theme. Remember that the theme is the subject in classical Arabic, whereas what I'm arguing for in Maltese, and it extends for the dialects really, is that the theme is really an object. Right, so Maltese happens to be blessed with um, differential object marking, which I am really relying on to you know, establish firmly that we're actually dealing with an object theme. So depending on how high up on the animacy hierarchy you are, Maltese displays um, lil marking or non lil marking on the object, as opposed to the second object. Second objects are always marked. Okay, so this is why it's a differential object marking as opposed to object two or secondary object marking. Right. So this is a transitive verb C. So what we see is that when you've got girl, which is human, yet indefinite. Lil marking is impossible, okay? You've got to say, right, tifla. However, when you get definiteness on that same um, argument, lil marking becomes optional. However, when you go even higher on the animacy hierarchy, such that you get, you get a proper noun, which is the maximum you can go in terms of referentiality and animacy, then you have to have the lil marking, okay? So this is what you get with a canonical verbal predicate. And lo and behold, this is exactly the same pattern you get with and, okay? So depending on whether you, possessive and that is. So depending on um, what the team looks like, as it were, you get um, the appropriate lil marking or not. So I take this to really imply to me that the theme in Maltese is really an object. Moreover, um, Another fact is that if, if we consider the use of and in blue now, hence in its locative use, which also takes an object, right? Because you know, prepositions take objects as their argument. We observe that prepositional uses do not lil mark their object. So this is, um, so lil marking is solely something related to verbal predicates. So it's just verbal predicates that mark their object with lil. Okay, so in this context, and in the locative use, is functioning just as any other preposition in the language. Okay, such that it is not lil marking its object argument. Good. Okay, so to conclude this little summary here. Basically, I think that uh, what we've got here is a change via morphological conversion. So there is really nothing which is yielding the change, as it were, from a minor category, that's a preposition, to a major class category, which is a verb, which is a bit non-prototypical, such a, such a change. And I believe that syntactically the change must have taken place via a reanalysis of the structure's topic into a subject. And Camry has an argument for this in saying that, yes, indeed, there is a correlation uh, between the fact that the possessor is high in animacy usually, and that would relate it easily to a topic. And in, similarly, there is another correlation between uh, topichood and subjecthood. So it's easy for such a change to have taken place via a topicalized structure. And then consequently, if we initially went through a topicalization stage and then we ended up with a transitive structure, then yes, there must have been an important reanalysis of the resumptive pronoun into an agreement marker. And then eventually the optional dropping of the possessor and noun phrase itself. Yes, so all this, the grammaticalization of the pronoun especially, 
has resulted in the formation of this class of predicates, which are referred to as pseudo-verbs in the literature of Maltese and Arabic. So essentially, these are referred to as pseudo-verbs because while they take verbal uses and auxiliary interpretations sometimes as well, and features which are typically associated with auxiliaries or verbs, nonetheless, the stem form is not verbal, really, just as and, okay? So we know that and came out of a preposition. So that makes them kind of a class of their own. Additionally, um, the subject is, ends up being expressed non-canonically as well. So instead of the usual nominative inflection, you end up with a genitive or accusative inflectional form. So if we consider this paradigm, if we're, we're saying now that and, our possessive use, is actually a verb, just like any other, the difference, however, is that it's a completely different paradigm. So this would be the usual paradigm of a canonical verb form in Maltese, which would be split uh, on the basis of perfective and perfective, and that's nominative inflection. Whereas, on the other hand, we're saying that and is, being fu is functioning as a verb in possessive constructions, at least. Hence, the e, ek, etc. is really yield realizing the subject. And for that matter, therefore, this is a non-canonically realized subject. Okay? And this happens to be genitive inflection. It could have been accusative inflection. Okay. So, so far I just discussed and, to be honest. But la has to come in at some point, right? Because I had mentioned that um, classical Arabic has two prepositions, and this is a journey which looks at both and and la. What I have to mention prior to this is that all that I've said for and follows exactly for la, okay? Such that, in the, historically, it was a preposition, but synchronically, it must be functioning as a verb. The little, I mean, the further complexity which la involves is that it is never found, at least as a verb form, it's never found hanging on its own, as it were. It's never found like and. Rather, it's always part of a larger word form, okay? So look at this l here within the word form kellu, and look at this l there, which is part of the word form ikollu. So I want you to keep in mind this split, andu on one hand, and kellu, ikollu, and the rest of the inflections on the other, okay? Right. So this is what I believe to be the trajectory of change that took place in Maltese. So this part is, this part is fairly uncontroversial. So we started off with some sort of preposition, which is la, and in classical Arabic it had both a possessive use and a locative use. And from that we know, because we have it synchronically in the language, that the prepositional la is still a prepositional la in some instances in Maltese. Additionally, it also developed as a case marker, okay? And that case marker was initially a dative, and then it shifted on to becoming an accusative. Yet, this part now is what I wish to share with you. So the red part of the diagram here is something which we do not have evidence for synchronically. We don't have no evidence to claim, as in data that is, to claim that la was ever a verb form that expressed a possessive relationship in Maltese. However, what I'll be trying to do in the remaining of this talk is to actually get to that inference via what goes on elsewhere in the language, okay? Then, and comes in at some point in the history. It was once a preposition. Then it itself changed into becoming a verb. And somehow, and this is what I want to show you, somehow it fused in the paradigm of la. They were both being used as possessive predicates, as they are synchronically in the language. And then, from then on, they also shifted off to become, developed further, that is, into becoming modal auxiliaries as well. Right. So let's go through that journey, okay? Okay, so la as a preposition, that's no problem, in the sense that um, the tu there is in front of a locative. In C, there is true that God is kind of a human being, but the interpretation of this is literally from lip to God, is like God as a destination. Okay, so I'm glossing it as a preposition in this context. So that's the use of la as a preposition with alative um, case, possibly, as well. Then la as a case marker, I think it's fairly established this as well, that something like, I didn't send 
the letter to you. That should have been the letter to you, not you, the letter. So um, letter is the, the direct object, which is co-referred to through this accusative pronominal form, which is 3SGF, because um, it, letter is singular feminine. And that le is marking the second person, which is the intransitive, uh, the, the di indirect object. That's what I meant to say, indirect object. So to you, okay? I sent the letter to you. Then it has also developed, as I had already shown, as an accusative marker. So Paul, which is here, the in st structurally it is the topic, yet it is bound to the object of C, of the verb to C. And hence, because it's an object, it has to take accusative marking. And that's the L which you see on Paolo there. Right. So then, if I'm somehow saying that synchronically, 36 is ungrammatical, okay? Something like Paolo Lahu or Lu Ktip is impossible in Maltese. Then this seems to be in conflict, right? With what I'm trying to say, that once upon a time, La was indeed a possessive predicate in Maltese. However, what I wish to share with you is that I think um, there is two pieces at least of evidence which we can use to infer that once upon a time in Old Maltese, that was in fact possible. Okay. Right. So let's consider what's been said on Maltese in the literature. So every discussion on Maltese possessives always illustrate the ungrammaticality of 38. So 38 is really ungrammatical, okay? So it's impossible to get um, and, the possessive and, in the context of an auxiliary to be, okay? So the claim, therefore, the inference, the common inference, is that um, Kell and Dicol, which I told you to keep in mind, that paradigm which we saw earlier, the claim is that in non-present tense context, and can't, can't, occur, can't appear, in which case the language needs to refer to resort to the Kell form and the Ecole form, which the literature treats as being in a paradigmatic relationship. So what I want to say, however, is that rather than being in a paradigmatic relationship, Kell, La, and And are in an allomorphic relationship. So what I wish to push here is that La and And are actually on the same level, even synchronically. So this is how I get to, and I'm going to tell you the evidence for that now. So, so this would be the structure I am assuming for something like Paul had a book, okay? Remember that had is a context where it's a non-present tense context, and hence and should not be able to occur, okay? Given the ungrammaticality of kin and, right? So I'm using at the back of my analysis, there's lexical functional grammar, which is very surfacey, a base, base theory. But essentially what this is showing simply is that this is a normal subject, okay, that's the possessor. And then ktip, um, the theme, is an internal argument to the, to the verb, to the predicate, which is have. So what I'm saying further is that kellu is really the fusion of the auxiliary, which is the auxiliary kin, the auxiliary to be, which is yielding simply tense features, and the diachronic preposition la, which has now become a verb form. And together, they end up with the lexical form kellu. And actually, this is what's referred to as lexical sharing. This is exactly the analysis you get for um, I'll go in I'll go, like I will go in English, okay, where you've got the fusion, literally the fusion of the subject along with the auxiliary. So that's how LFG, lexical functional grammar, would treat um, the fact that you've got literally one lexical item, but with two completely different functions, okay? That would be the fusion of the N node and the V node, whereas what we've got, and the I node, whereas what we've got in Maltese is the fusion of the I node and the V node. So how do I get to that? Well. I think the major evidence which I am, I am using in order to claim that that is the case, that that is really the analysis, is because 
is due to something that has not been discussed in the literature prior to my dissertation, as it were. So while it has been said that and never occurs in, in non-present tense context, well, this data actually shows you that, yes, indeed, you can have and in context of non-present tense, because kin is what's providing you with a past tense. And yeah, this is also kin, which is past tense, okay? So this data exists, okay? So it's not the case that and cannot be used in the context of kin, which is the past tense. Right, so this is, this is literally the analysis of the morphology, the morphophonology and the syntax in one slide, to be honest. So what seems to be going on, I think, is that um, the possessive predicate, okay, so yeah, sorry. What's crucial for me is the presence of something which is coming in between kin and and, okay? That is crucial for me. Because if I remove them, if I remove this already and that still, I end up with an ungrammatical sentence, okay? Just as we had earlier. We had an ungrammatical sentence earlier. Right. So what I'm saying is that the possessive predicate and, what it does actually exhibit is simply an adjacency restriction whereby the adjacency of the possessive predicate with the auxiliary, kin in a, both its perfective and imperfective forms, actually comes to trigger the presence of a suppletive allomorphic form, okay? And that's how you get the fusion of kin and la. Since you can't have kin and and together, and changes its form, as it were, to la, and you end up with kin la, and via morphophonological um, result of enclitization, because L is really prone to erosion in, in Maltese, you end up with this enclitization of the predicate onto the auxiliary, and morphosyntactically then, you end up with lexical sharing. So that's how I arrived to the allomorphic relationship, being simply triggered by this adjacency restriction, apparently. Right, so at this point, where are we? Okay, so while it's true that there is no actual data, to be honest, that um, I can claim that la was synchronic, uh, was diachronically really a possessive predicate in Maltese. Yet I believe that we can, you know, still get to the fact that from this we can still infer that la was present in old Maltese. So how? So at this point we observe that the original preposition and must have developed as a verb, okay? And at some stage, as a verb form, it has fused into the paradigm of la. So that implies that la could have existed as the, only, as the only verbal possessive predicate in Maltese, with and possibly being used also as a possessive predicate, but possibly with prepositional status, who knows, if it was even present as a possessive predicate. So when and comes in, as it were, as a verb, it seems to wipe off the older use of la, yet it comes to demonstrate this subjacency constraint, which is, by the way, not demonstrated by the prepositional counterpart, because we can have uh, ilktib, kin, and paulu, okay? So kin and in the, in the locative construction is a possible combination as opposed to kin and in the possessive construction which is ungrammatical, okay? So there is a difference there. So apparently this adjacency constraint at least at the verbal use of and seems to block the use of and and then the pred form la comes to be used. Then what happens is that and classization of la at some point took place. So I'm assuming that possibly kin la was available. And then you end up with erosion of the la. And then enclitization takes place, such that you end up with the form kel. Okay? And what's really, really important for my statement that it was already a verb form is that if you observe the incorporation, let me just give you an example to see the gloss especially, sorry, yeah. So if you consider the way I'm glossing kel and ikol, you, should, you might have observed that this is actually third person, this is imperfective, singular masculine, and this is B perfective, singular, third person, singular masculine. So with that, this is the only possible verb form, okay, with respect to the auxiliary. So with that, I assume that since you had already 
undergone, since you, we're already observing this change, it implies that the grammatical function, thematic roles, had already been switched, had already um, developed from what we had in classical Arabic. Because remember, in classical Arabic, the auxiliary can, actually has to agree with the theme. And the theme need not always be a third person, singular, masculine. Third person, singular, masculine. Could have been feminine, right? Yet, the reordering, the remapping, which you observe then once the possessive structure changes from an intransitive one into a transitive one, and then the switch in the grammatical function and theta are all mapping such that the theme is no longer the subject but is now the object, ends up with uh, the auxiliary being defaulting to the third person singular masculine. Okay? So the fact that the incorporation of the predicate law onto the auxiliary is onto a third person singular masculine auxiliary I take to imply as being indicative of the mapping which had already taken place. So my belief that this allomorphic relationship seems to, have, seems to have become at some point so robust that it really shifted off together, developed further, like in a block. So it's not that and went on its, went on its own and la went on its own, rather as a block in an allomorphic relationship, they shifted into also becoming modal auxiliaries. And this shift, however, is not present in the rest of the, the Arabic vernaculars. However, I should just mention that in Latakian Syrian, the construction ili alp, which is literally I have a heart, okay, uh, which is a pure possessive construction, has now come to be able to subcategorize for a clause, okay, and Together with a following clause, it comes to yield a have to interpretation, so a modal use. Okay? So this is the closest example I could find from the other vernaculars where a possessive structure is kind of developing or yielding a um, modal value. So what I want to say is that the allomorphically related possessive predicates and and la have also developed as modal auxiliaries in Maltese. And this is actually mentioned, the modal use is mentioned in the literature. What they don't do, however, is the connection between the possessive predicate and the modal predicate, which is, by the way, as I will show you, a common trajectory of grammaticalization across languages. Okay? So these are different um, uses of the, the and and the call and the kel as modal auxiliaries. So what's beautiful about 43 is that it uses and in this context, the first and, is the real modal use, and ikol, the second that follows, is actually the possessive use. So this is a free, free relative, actually, free relative clause. So minya is a literate taiba, whoever chooses the good way, and we call it prosperita. So have, the modal have, have, has to have, as it were, has to have. So that is the modal have, this is the possessive have, okay, and that's the theme of the possessive. So that that's really goes to show the, you know, the robustness of the grammaticalization of and and the rest of the paradigm as, as modal auxiliaries, because they, they can then take a, a possessive predicate. Right. What's crucial, however, to mention is that the claim is that the fusion which took place, apart from the fact that they refer to them as uh, being in a paradigmatic relationship, which I'm saying that they are actually in an allomorphic relationship and not a paradigmatic one. The additional fact that all the previous literature says is that uh, these irregular forms are actually derived out of the combination of the, the auxiliary with the preposition. Whereas what I have been trying to show you all along is that this is actually the verb form that we're dealing with and no longer the old auxiliary. So this is not the case that we're dealing with an auxiliary. Rather, we're dealing with a morph form, it's true, Kel and Nicole, but that morph form does not involve a preposition, but actually a verb form. And I believe that to have demonstrated that the possessive predicate and in Maltese is actually a V and not a preposition, and to have just posited an allomorphic relationship, then it should follow that uh, La should also be of the same category, right? You can't have a, an allomorphic relationship between a verb form and a preposition, they should at least share a category. Right, so 
In my dissertation, however, <laughs> I provide an alternative analysis. The possibility of treating the le part as a dative marker. However, and now I scrap it, because that can't be either. So the possibilities are that it's a preposition uh, or a dative, since, it, as I showed you, it has developed as a dative marker in the language, or as a V. So now I'm positing a V analysis, but in my dissertation I had posited a dative analysis. Whereas that can't be, why? Because if we consider a proper dative use, okay, so the recipient, um, so the le here, so as for the children, she sent the book to them yesterday, okay? So this is the to them, as it were. This is introducing the to them. Doubling that pronoun requires the presence of a dative marked NP, or as a dative marked pronominal form, but not a nominative, okay? So I can't have, sorry, that should be they. This is, um, sorry, this is a typo then. Actually, this is a typo as well. <laughs> okay, so what I meant to show is that the doubling of this pronoun, which is attached onto the verb, must be via a dative marked NP or pronoun, okay? So litfal and lilum. However, the doubling of the l followed by its argument, in the case of kel and ikol, must actually be not via the dative, but via the nominative, okay? So I think that goes to show that it can't be the case that that is a dative marker. Because if it were the case, then we would expect doubling to be via the dative marker as well. But that's not the case. However, this is the last point, essentially. There is another piece of proof to help me further deduce that we are really dealing with a la that was already a verb form, as opposed to a preposition. OK, so back to our. So this we got to now, OK? We've shown this part, as it were. Now we're still stuck with this. But I'm going to show you that because we've got this, we're going to infer that this was the case. And I'm going to make extensive use of grammaticalization theory in this context. So what red, the red part is, in, is, is representative now of, is, of now is what we're going to try to infer from the very presence of this additional grammaticalization in, in the language. So in order for something to have become an auxiliary, that meant that at least there was something verbal preceding it. So we're still stuck with 48, which is ungrammatical. And it's like we're trying to say that that was really possible in, in old Maltese. And I'm going to, I think it's possible to infer that that was really the case via these three well-known clients um, present cross-linguistically with the help of grammaticalizing theory. So essentially, grammatical morphemes are always, canonically at least, always derived out of lexical morphemes. And in order to get to an auxiliary, and even further a clitic, we have to have a full verb somewhere, okay? And then it ends up as an affix of some sort. Additionally, it has been shown cross-linguistically that um, features, important morphosyntactic and morphosemantic features, such as perfect, resultative, tense, and mood, have been shown to cross-linguistically frequently been derived from possession schemas. Actually, if you take English, English is a canonical instance, okay? So you have the verb have, which is used for both possession as well as for a modal, as well as for a perfect use, okay? So in order for all that to have been derived, there must have been a common V, at least, verb. So this was something which had never been mentioned before which is really nice, I think, that actually the possessive predicate, la, has indeed in Maltese developed as a universal perfect marker. And what's beautiful is that I find this attestation, the first one, from Cantilena. Cantilena is the oldest ever written Maltese script. We don't have something earlier, unfortunately. But what's beautiful is that 1470, for sure, this structure was already grammaticalized. So basically, this structure, as you can see, this is the il form, okay, which is the la, okay? But as I said, it's prone to um, erosion. Uh, what's happening here is that, to me, literally, this would be, this would literally be to me, ili, zmin. So to me, time. So that construction is equivalent to the possessive structures we've just saw for the for classical Arabic. To me, a bread, 
for example. And in this context, this is to me time, and then you've got another embedded clause. And together, that construction actually yields the universal perfect in Maltese. So this is how we are able to say, uh, I've been building, for example, or we haven't been talking for a long time, for example. So in order to assume that this law is now synchronically a grammatical morpheme of some sort, at least, at least it's providing us with a perfect aspect, okay? So it is grammatical in this respect. Then at some point, the original proposition must have underwent a change into it becoming a verb form, I believe. What's beautiful is that at the same time, um, Holman discovered that indeed in Syrian, you get exactly the same construction, okay? So this is something which classical Arabic does not have, but all the dialects have. So this is something so beautiful, such that the same law, which is also found in the rest of the dialects as a possessive predicate, but unfortunately, I'm saying in Maltese, this was present in old Maltese, but we only have fragments of it, as it were. The same process took place, okay? So there are good reasons to believe that you know, the grammaticalization of the possessive predicate into a perfect marker must have taken place quite early in the language. And that would you know, require that this was once a verb form for it to have become an auxiliary, a, a pure lexical verb form that is. So a possessive predicate which is verbal in nature. So the reason to believe that this was an early grammaticalization is from the fact that initially there is no alternation with and. Okay, so well, you could argue there are possible, I mean, d multiple ways how to, you know, question this. Why, why is it this not the case? Well, possibly and was not a possessive predicate at all and was purely a locative one. Or else if it were also a possessive predicate, it did not yet have verbal status. It was still a proposition. Who knows? Secondly, if they were actually both available in the language as possessive predicates, I mean as verbs, that is, in principle, nothing would have restricted the la to develop as a, as a perfect marker, as opposed to and from developing as a perfect marker. Why? Because um, Tunisian, actually, which does not have the use of la as a possessive predicate, has developed and, which is the only possessive predicate that, which they have available as their um, universal perfect realizing auxiliary. So that is beautiful. I mean, it could have been either way, in principle, if it were true that we had both, uh, both both, um, both and and la functioning as possessive predicates in Maltese. Right. Secondly, it must have been an earlier construction. Why? Because the past tense realization does not involve an inclicization. So here we observe that um, ilu, il, the same la, <laughs> is in the context of the auxiliary b, but this time there is no fusion, such that this could have become kelli or kellu. Nothing prohibits it. Yet, this is not the case. So possibly, at that stage in the language's history, la still had like a full, full uh, phonological status, as opposed to now, where it is highly, highly um, eroded. Unfortunately, that's not just it. There is an additional twist. So, so that's, that's how I think we end up with a verb form, OK, so far. Yet, there is an additional grammaticalization yeah, if you want to call it grammaticalization. So I've just said that, um, in my analysis at least, that kel and the call are fusions of an I node, an inflectional node, as well as a verb node, right? And they yield that one. Yet, what's happening now, synchronically, which is something I haven't encountered in the Arabic dialects, though, is that it seems that kel and the call are now becoming bleached of their once upon a time, tense and mood value. How come? So what's happening is that you can actually repeat the, the auxiliary now. So you can have something like cont, so that's our typical um, auxiliary, conja kellek, and then you have another kellek. So I had initially mentioned that kellek is really the fusion of I plus V. What I'm saying now is that it can't be the case any longer in these constructions because there can be only one I node, right? So, and this is the real tense bearer, whereas this one is simply functioning as a perfective predicate. 
In fact, it yields past perfect, just as any other perfected predicate. Same here. So, say kun. So, this would be your auxiliary, irrealis, or habitual, depending on how it's used. And then you get kellum as well. Kin equally. Right. So, the evidence I use in, you know, thinking that what was once, a few, or what's still lexical sharing at one part of the grammar can't be the case in this context is because essentially the interpretation of the auxiliary plus kel and the col and their inflections is really the equivalent of any other lexical predicate you could have had in the language. So the combination of, for example, kin, perfective kin, along with a perfective lexical verb form yields the past perfect in Maltese. And that's exactly what you get in, in konja kellek. So kellek, if I had any other verb, any other perfective verb, the interpretation is past perfect, okay? So that's the combination. Crucially, there is a major constraint in the language such that, um, with respect to auxiliary ordering, that the imperfective form of ikun must always follow the perfective form of kin, okay? If we still want to believe, which we're not doing, if we still were to believe that um, there is still some sort of I, so that is inflectional, um, inflection interpretations in Kel and Nicole in such contexts, then it would be impossible to account for B. Because in B we observe Ikun, but which is preceding Kel. And if Kel is really synchronically the fusion of I plus V, then it's as though we're saying we've got Kin, under, under ikun. So that's the perfective form of the auxiliary under the imperfective. And that wouldn't be possible, okay, to say that. So we have to assume that in this context, this is no longer involving lexical sharing between an I node and a V node, but rather it's an, it ends up being um, a verb form in itself. Right, so to conclude, Old Maltese must have had a possessive construction, I believe, in which the predicate law was used across the board, yes. And from a preposition, it, has, it had developed into a verb already. Synchronically, there are contexts where, yes, the verbal and auxiliary forms, la and and, are actually in an allomorphic relationship. And another, I think, beautiful illustration is that um, the grammaticalization of the possessive structure in Maltese has taken place twice, but at different times and different points in history. So the initial grammaticalization was when la was the only possessive predicate, out of which you get the universal perfect in Maltese. And secondly, at a later stage, that is, this had already come about, the allomorphic relationship, out of which possessive, so the possessive structure which involved this relationship, you end up getting the modal interpretations. So that was it, really. <laughs> Although I can show you, for, is there time, what? Uh, or questions, 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 whichever. Questions. No, basically, I was going to show that Hebrew is doing the same thing, OK? Literary Hebrew is exactly like classical, yet um, colloquial Hebrew is doing something different, which is exactly pushing towards a transitive structure. So as you can see, I think it's clear that you get the same le marking in, the, in Hebrew. This is literary Hebrew. And um, agreement is usually with the theme, with watch in that context. Yet what's happening is that, first of all, if you get, um, while the possessi takes nominative case, okay, apparently that is nominative, the theme is nominative in literary Hebrew. So the possessi, the theme that is, yeah. In colloquial Hebrew, this is taking et marking. So et marking is the accusative equivalent, okay? So that is a change which we also saw for Maltese, where the team got the lil marking. Secondly, in literary Hebrew agreement on the auxiliary, that is, is controlled by the possessi, whereas now in, in colloquial Hebrew, the, the agreement is no longer being controlled by, agreement on the auxiliary is no longer being controlled by that. Secondly, while the possessi could undergo subject-to-subject -subject raising, so it would be the watch which agreed with the matrix predicate. Uh, in colloquial Hebrew, this is no longer the case. Okay? Additionally, in terms of word order, the, possessive, the possessor is shifting its position to come before the, the auxiliary. So, so that's, that's exactly it in the case of colloquial Hebrew. So 
according to Kamri, many Arabic vernaculars have undergone exactly the same changes for, for like what you see in Maltese. And when it comes to the agreement on the auxiliary, because that is really telling, uh, his claim is that um, the only, virtually the only option is to get third person singular marking on the auxiliary, okay? as opposed to the theme agreement which you observe in classical Arabic. However, the wrong conclusion that's deduced, at least in Cumbria 1991, is the claim that because of such a default tree SGM marking on the, on the auxiliary, such constructions do not have a subject. This is his quote, okay? This suggests that in Maltese and by extension, the Levantine dialects, in them, neither argument is subject. Indeed, that the sentence has no subject, is in person. So this is the claim in Cumbria. But I think I've shown good evidence that actually th these possessive structures actually do have a subject, and the subject is the possessor. Right, so if you then consider the dialects themselves, possessive constructions in Palestinian, well, you get GM marking, even though in principle you could have had um, agreement with the team. Yet, so something like 64 is really marginal, okay? So agreement with the team, which is feminine, girl, is very marginal, okay, to get that. Rather, it is GM that you uh, default to a person singular masculine that you get. Um, what's beautiful also is that they can get the negation, which is the one with which you usually express verb forms as opposed to prepositions. However, then, in Tunisian and Moroccan dialects, the situation is a bit more complex in that, literally, they can have default agreement, agreement with the team, as well as agreement with the possessor. Okay? So, in whichever way you look, at, you look at it, what's crucial is that, for sure, there has been a shift in the mapping between the grammatical functions and the thematic roles um, when considering the development from classical Arabic to the dialects, really. That's it. Good. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Okay, I'll, I'll ask. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with one question. Then. Um, I guess the most relevant to this, exactly what you're saying here now, is I'm wondering, you know, on your story, why is it possible at all to say, Kim Un? Right. I think and that... Then, then let me sorry. Just, uh, so, i.e., <laughs> why um, it, it is, it's, you're trying to say, okay, you, you need the thing in between, the jap or whatever, he and jap, but the point is, um, you have this possessive andi, which is first person singular, and the past auxiliary can agree with that in person, but it doesn't have to. Whereas with a true verb, it would have to agree in person. So how come it's allowed to not agree? Right. My story is simply that this is a non-canonically realized subject. So this is genitive inflection as opposed to the canonical nominative inflection. And as goes on in other languages, like in Eichenwald et al. 2001, they really show that in many places when you get... Um, when you get non-canonical realizations of, for example, object or subject, you simply default to whatever your language defaults to. And it happens that in Arabic it is the default to the 3SGM form. Okay. Yeah, that would be my answer, to be honest. Okay. And it, I mean, if you look at Syrian and Maltese, agreement is allowed, but people will always go to the default form. So I could say Kont Jandi as well. Yet, I think if you do a survey, people would prefer the 3SGM. It's like, yeah. Talk. Um, I was wondering how the kind of stories that you present here fits with other grammaticalization pathways within a language. I'm particularly I was interested in like development of auxiliaries and modes. Um, so yeah, I'd like to ask about the whole question. Yeah, so modes in Maltese are and Arabic because they're the same. Are really are really all pseudo verbs. So pseudo verbs are exactly the sort of things which I had been discussing here. So they really are a class of their own. And um, this, this, this and, however, and la, is not a model in, in the other dialects. So there is an argument in the literature by Van Hove, 
who believes that that is an influence from our Italian ancestors, as it were, when they colonized the island. So she believes that there is a context story for the grammaticalization of, of this paradigm as a model. Yet, in general, they are really an odd class of predicates. It's true. It's true. They are a very odd class of predicates, models in Arabic. Yeah, they are not the canonical verb forms at all. Yeah. So they could actually be, they could have um, just a, a default tree as third person singular feminine masculine form only, for example. Yeah. Ju the, the only thing which is nice, I mean, what's nice with respect to this specific model is that it follows trajectory of changes from possessive structures to other, which is something which is well known. It's just that apparently no one, at least Heine, which I read so much, um, s believes that this is really not something that goes beyond Indo-European, but this is actually something which we're saying goes beyond, especially the, the universal perfect as well, which is present in in the other dialects. Yeah. You had another? Did you have another? Oh, many. <laughs> 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 uh, Tell me. Yeah, okay, yeah, my, this is actually a, a, a smaller question. So on, you have examples 11 and 12, so right at the beginning, um, when you were introducing Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, not knowing enough about the language and, and how it does things, can you ever end up with context in which, in which it's ambiguous in these kind of things? No. So, not having what in 12b, for example, where you obviously have some marking, do you ever have context in which the yeah is ambiguous? Mm, there are lots of factors playing a role. So, for example, the definiteness of the theme, typically in a possessive structure. Typically, um, you'd get an indefinite team as opposed to uh, in a locative structure where the team is typically definite. That is one. Secondly, a crucial point is that um, while in B, that U is really agreement and you can't change it with an NP, the argument of the real preposition AND can alternate between being a pronoun as well as an NP. So that those two factors are really crucial. And while that is the canonical order of each, I mean, shifting them would result in a topic structure. So in this case, in the, in the prepositional one, in the locative one, in 11b, is actually, that is its canonical position, as opposed to ktip in the possessive, which is in its canonical position, as it were. So in that way, no, there wouldn't be ambiguity in that way. We, you will need the progressive marker, ed, on the adjective. It, I already thought about that. I would need to insert it. Paulu, and the sap or adjective. You need the progressive, which kind of locates it further. So that's something like is being a book? Yes, it, literally, at him, is being book. Or is located book. Yeah. Yeah, the differential object marking. The indefinite entries happen with proper names. No, not really, because in B, um, the definite allows optional case marking. Sorry, in B. B, the accusative marking is optional, as opposed to C, where it's obligatory. Right. That is kind of the minute difference. You can't, exactly. Uh, since yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> it's just notation, yeah. True, sorry.
and it can't be adjacent to Hebrew because in other Arabic varieties it's fine. Well, in its prepositional state function, it's no, definitely in the not. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also fine. Yeah, but, um, exactly. I mean. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I think that gives me. I think it gives me a much more of a point than saying that this could be <coughs> really a constraint, which is what is triggering my allomorphic con It's yeah. like a, no, a condition. Enough, I, yeah, from a, uh, like from a kind of synchronic point of view, I think it's a very nice piece yes, of data, but, but I'm <laughs> interested to know why, why? This, this change has come about. True. I mean, can you think of other, um, anything else in the language where, you know, if there isn't some kind of intervening adverb, we get ungrammatical. Mm. Really. Yeah, it's an odd one. It's like a blocking effect. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, maybe just following up on that point. Then there's obviously no difference in like phrasing, intonation when you put in an adverb or something. Like I that. mean, that's yeah. why I chose on purpose an adverb mm. because if it were something else, then it would be a clause. Yeah. And then if you shift the clause, then I mean, you're in another clause. It's another predicate of some sort, and. No, no change in intonation at all. Yeah. What, what, what is important, however, is that for now it seems to me that it's a finite class of things which can come in between. So it's really three items which I found, which is the still, already, and perhaps, forcing. Else, I'll just default to Kel, which is the... And that doesn't link to the kind of Aspect no, at that point, no. You're still pure past tense. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why, at that point, I believe that we're still I plus V, as it were. But then when you get the kin and the scale formation and the call formation, all that's clearly something which is devoid of tense features at all, because the I position now is filled again by an auxiliary of some sort. And even the interpretation. It's purely perfective as opposed to past. But yes, it's odd. Yeah. Uh, I have one question about lab. You said that sometimes can function as an electricity marker. Yes. Is it the case in classical Arabic as well? Or only not? Le, uh, I don't think, no. Okay, and also, I don't know how you come to the conclusion that lab mm -hmm. is an accused marker, even in this example. Why wouldn't... What did make you decide it's an acoustic marker? Well, because I'm assuming... So what would be the alternative? Still, a position. But there's something omitting between the verb and the girl. So another interpretation would be <coughs> I saw something that mm -hmm. walked to the girl. I saw something? Yeah, I saw the book, like, or I, I found the book yeah. to her. Ah, you mean why is this not being analyzed as because a as a only second vowels are uh, case markers in in Arabic, and uh, you can think of any variety of Arabic where there is there is a consonant or well, la is not a pure consonant, but still I would categorize it as a consonant uh, as as used as a case marker. Well, I mean. In the literature, la as a dative case marker is well known, even for the dialects themselves. So if you take Egyptian, for example, Only which... No, I'm Only talking easy. about the dialects. Okay. So if you take mm -hmm. Egyptian, which is really neat because it has the ma negation, just like Maltese, what happens is that you can still get the le pronoun inside the verbal construct. So you get the verb form, and then you get ma in front, and then you get two pronouns, because you've got two slots available for the accusative and the dative. And then you kind of close it with the sh. And that gives you evidence that this is really a verb form, which includes within it two pronominal forms, one of which is dative marked. So there, is argu there are arguments in the literature that the le as a dative, the le realizing the recipient or the goal or the secondary object or the indirect object, whatever you want to call it, in that use, the lil has developed as a case marker. There is evidence for this in the literature. Now, what Maltese seems to have done is to kind of take this a step further. It's true that this 
thing, this fact does not happen in the other dialects, this part, the accusative, which I'm glossing as accusative. So what seems to have, what I do not agree with you is that ra is a typical, c, the verb to c is a typical two-place predicate, subject, object. So object, I mean, Maria is what's being seen, and I guess the most neutral way of considering Maria is to be the object and not the secondary object. Whereas with your analysis, I'll be trying to force a secondary object interpretation to Maria, which I wouldn't want to. And actually, if I substitute Maria by a pronoun, I do not get rightla, but I get raita. So there is no little marking there. Well. Because you're treating this as a prepositional phrase. You're treating that as a prepositional phrase. Whereas I'm treating it as a, I'm treating it as a noun phrase that is that is accusative mark. Like still, this is not a complete thought to me. I mean, be not even be. It's not a complete thought unless there is a context where something is missing. Oh, this is more tears. Yeah, yeah, but, but the, the example from Egyptian, I would say. Uh, no, I'm th I'm thinking of bat, for example, send, batilha, for example, batilha jawab or whatever, batilha kitab. That lha, uh, and if you negate it, it will become ma batil hish. And that hish, ash or what? Yeah, ash exactly with the mala. So there, that can only be treated as a pronominal form and not a pp inside a verb phrase. How can it be a pp inside a verb form? It wouldn't make sense if you still want to consider it as a pp, prepositional phrase it is. But I mean, even ra'a in Arabic is really a two-place predicate. So I wonder how you can force a, a secondary object reading to the item that's being seen. That's what I, I do not agree with you. Because if this were shaf, shafaha, Shaf is also a two place predicate like Ra, no? Well, uh, are you talking now about Pascal Arabic? No, I'm talking about dialects, Shaf. And but Ra, this right is exactly the same as used in classical. Yeah, still. I would the, say the point is, in order to say Ra'i to Maria in Maltese, you must say Ra'it Lil Maria. That's how you say it in Maltese. Yeah, but, but, but in dialects, yeah, Maltese is odd like this. In other, dialect, other dialects are different, but Maltese is like this. Yeah, so differential object marking is only found with object, I meant, not secondary object. It's only present in Maltese. The other dialects do not seem to have it or do not have it. As opposed to the dative, the dative is a cross. This is accusative, though. Ten. So, if you go back to Muslim Arabic and look at directional prepositions, there's two. There's li la, which is one, and then there's illa. Aywa, 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 aywa. Yes, yes. Now, when I actually, it was really difficult to find la in class in Quran because yeah. usually they are all illa. Illa, illa, thanks, Jake. Sorry. Illa. No, no, that's illa. This is ah, no check, sir. Illa. illa. Yeah. Uh, it's a directional preposition, yes. and actually, I would say um, these are Lee ones. So. Can you do the previous slide? Uh, yes. Well, see, these are this is this one B uh, is is kind of odd actually, because in that in that context where it's truly directional, you expect illa mm. usually. Anyhow, that's, my point is that there are these two things, and they're very sim similar semantically, there's fine differences. Um, and then when you get to the dialects, now, I kind of, when I teach dialects, I say, illa is gone, doesn't exist. But if you, and kind of meaning-wise and function-wise, that, that, that's a convenient thing to say. But what you did, and you're by no means the first to do it, the whole time we're talking about something which is phonologically l or la, and then suddenly we have il, and you say it's the same. Ah, in the, you mean in the universal in the perfect? universal perfect. Mm. You say it's the same thing. And like I say, you're not, the, you're not at all the first to do this. And if you look at Arabic dialects, they do 
behind synchronically, they do seem to function the same way. So like, um, you know, he has his idol. There you are. And the negation is like, man. Or, so, or no, not man, but I don't know, man or in, in Egyptian. Anyway, this is kind of marginal as, yeah. as, a, as a possibility in most dialects. Yeah, illa. And the negation probably won't involve this in. Um, so it looks like they are part of the same thing, but I just wonder, are they re is it legitimate to really say, to say this is just the same thing? Mm. Especially as there is this historical True. precedent. True. You see what I'm saying? Yes. What, yeah, you're right, you have a point. What is nice, however, is that what's beautiful to retain, for sure, to maintain is the, the grammaticalization path. Because yeah. if this were really, let's say, if it were really the same law used in possessive structures, then this is one way in which one could expect grammaticalization, one way in which, one directional direction which a possessive structure could grammaticalize. So kind of it would fit nicely. I, I kind of suspect, but I think one mm. really ought to show this but, uh, somehow, but I kind of suspect that at some very early point, La and Ella fuse, can, fuse themselves. Collapse. True, yeah. true. So that would come even perhaps at the P stage, where yeah. when it was still a preposition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yes, you have a point for sure, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, they are morphologically extremely. So in classical Arabic, it's illa with a long a, but in most dialects, that final long vowel would be shortened anyway. So all you have is la versus illa. You know, they are extremely similar. Yeah. And then um, you typically also find, I mean, in the east, the more east you go and the more gulfy you become, sar is obligatory. In which case, then the vowel drops and you get sar la. So then kind of you're left with just the le. Whereas in Maltese and Syrian, I mean, at least when it's not with Assad, it's clearer there. Yeah. Yeah, but yes. Any last yeah. questions? Okay, well then let's thank Florence once again. Thank you.